We have a session called What I Wish I Knew Before I Got My MFA. Um, it's moderated by the Brooklyn Rails Joseph Salvatore, uh, who is the, also the author of To Assume a Pleasing Shape, a short story collection, and an assistant professor at the New School. Um, at the end, we have Naomi Jackson, who you may have seen read in our space. Uh, she went to the Iowa's Writers' Workshop and is the author of the novel The Star Side of Bird Hill. Next, Caitlin Greenidge, uh, who went to Hunter MFA program and is the author of We Love You, Charlie Freeman. And Kareem Demchecki, who went to Michener and is the author of Lifted by the Great Nothing. So I'll hand it to Joseph. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, and thanks, everybody, for, for coming. It's a real pleasure when I arrived to see so many folks here. Um, so this is, I think this is a kind of unique panel in the sense that it presumes um, folks are interested in getting some information beyond just what we are going to be riffing on ourselves. So we really want to not only save enough time for questions and answers, but to invite you truly to be part of the conversation. Um, uh, so if at any point you want a little clarification or an expansion on an answer or a question, just please chime in. I'll moderate and I'll, I'll take the questions. So feel free to raise your hand if at any point you just want to follow up with a question. Um, we're going to talk for a little while and hopefully raise some points that will activate some conversation. But before we do that, I think, you know, Ken had reminded me that maybe it's a good moment to ask, how many people here have already received their MFA degrees? Okay. And how many folks are here because they're interested, perhaps, in pursuing an MFA degree? That's a healthy, okay, it's about half and half. Great. Um, so maybe there'll be some anecdotes and some advice from the audience as well, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. I, I want to hear from our, our stars. I just feel like I'm the moderator, but I'll say quickly that I, uh, I think my, the, the, my route to the MFA program is an interesting one for this conversation. I, I was an undergraduate, undeclared, didn't know what I was doing, finally found my way to the English major, and there uh, began writing. From there, I did an, uh, um, uh, and it was at a state university in Massachusetts. And, it, and at that, when I graduated from there, I had a job, and my job was security guard. I was a security guard in an industrial complex in Salem, Massachusetts on weekends because nobody wanted the shift. Uh, so I opened the building at 7 a.m., I closed it at 11 on Saturdays, I opened it at 7 a.m. on Sundays, and I closed it at 7 p.m. on Sundays. So I had two days where, I, where there was nobody in the building. I was there literally for liability. If somebody came in to do a little bit of work, they needed somebody there. And what I started to realize was I could write here. I could work here. And um, when I graduated, I remembered the, 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 the owner of the business said, are you gonna, so what are you going to do after you graduate? I said, I'm going to continue to be a security guard. Uh, and, and for three more years, I stayed there in that, that little office, and I would back my car up, and I had all these milk crates full of manuscripts, books I needed to read. And in that, I'm mentioning this because I feel like I, it was my own intuitive way to give myself my own MFA program. But that suggests that there's a kind of romance, the artist in the garret, the isolation. Uh, and I think that there are many different ways and reasons we find our way to MFA programs and more and more opportunities that they can provide you. When I finally got to New York and I got my MFA at the new school, uh, and um, you know, there I was able to do things like launch a literary magazine, start a reading series, get to know other writers, agents, publishers. So there are many different ways that the MFA revealed itself to me as more than just a time and a place to write. Um, so I, I, I start that hopefully as a way to be thinking about the different ways we can conceive of why we go to MFA programs. And I thought what we could do is, is let our panelists discuss their experience briefly and perhaps offer some insights into what was working for them, what was good. Uh, but we also promised you some, some cons, so perhaps we'll be able to talk about some cons as well. Uh, maybe so. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Naomi Jackson. Um, as the slightly drunk sign behind us will tell you. <laughs> um, I graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop in 2013. Um, I was living in New York for a long time, I was born and raised in Flatbush, and I worked for about 10 years and then decided to make the transition to grad school. Um, so I like to talk, my story is actually, 
I guess it's interesting. Everyone thinks their story is interesting. Um, <laughs> um, so I graduated from Williams College in 2002, and then I got a job. Um, I worked in philanthropy and in development for about 10 years. Um, and along the way, I applied to grad school three different times, um, and the third time with feeling, um, as I like to say, and the first two times I didn't get in anywhere at all. Um, and it was kind of a cosmic joke because I got a raise, a $30,000 raise the same morning that I was um, admitted into the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, so I got a, I was like making six figures on paper that morning, and then that evening I was making $17,000 a year as a grad student <laughs> at Iowa. And so I think I was like maybe the first person in creation to be like, I'm gonna go to Iowa and see about this, because I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and my parents will rewrite history and say, oh, we were all always supportive. But the truth is they were West Indians, right? And immigrants. And they were like, you know what, save up little money. Um, take a year, defer. Um, and Iowa actually doesn't allow you to, defer, to defer, so that made the decision for me. Um, I think I thought of myself as a lot older because I turned 30 right before I went to Iowa, um, and I felt my age because there was a quite a big difference between the young people who had come straight out of college into Iowa and then people who had taken a, a significant amount of time off to work. The truth is, I wasn't really that old, um, and that um, there were a lot of people along the age spectrum. But I do think that that can be a really big distinction between people who've had a certain amount of life experience and work experience. Um, people who are immigrant, people who are working class, um, and and um, coming into this experience versus other people with class privilege and um, less life experience. Um, so. Uh, pros. I, for me, um, because I had been working and my job was really intense, I was traveling on an airplane almost every week um, for about four years before I went to grad school. For me, it was the time and space to follow ideas. Um, so when I was in New York and working full time, I felt a lot of pressure that every single idea that was seemed good, I had to work, right? And so um, the joy of having more space is that I could fail a lot more, which meant that the good things rose to the top rather than keeping on working on bad things because they were working in the two hours that I had yeah. to give to them at night or on the weekends. <clears throat> so the time and space was really important. Um, at Iowa, there was a lot of networking and talent scouting by agents and editors, and so I felt like I had spent a lot of time in New York feeling close to publishing, but being very much outside of it. Um, and so ironically, going to Iowa gave me more access to that than I had in New York City. Mm. Um, and more than that, though, I think that is only as useful as your work is ready. Um, and so for most people, it takes them a long time to get to a project to a place where it's publishable. And so for most people, I think the pro is building a community of trusted readers mm -hmm. um, and uh, other writers who you can compare notes with, commiserate with, um, yeah. exchange manuscripts with. So like when I was working on my last novel, the ending sucked. I, who knows if it still sucks, I don't know. Um, but I sent my ending like 20 pages to a good friend and she read the whole book in a week and gave me wow. notes on everything. And that's not something that you will that's not your average bear, um, and that's what happens when you spend two years in a kind of weird place with people <laughs> and read their work. Um, so, and then cons, I think everybody knows this. I think that there's an incredible amount of emotional, intellectual, and spiritual fortitude that one needs to get through the workshop experience, um, and also to leave home and try and make a creative life in a place that's not meant for you, right? So Iowa City is not designed for black lesbians from Brooklyn. Uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, I'll just leave, leave it at that. That's the period at the end of that sentence. Um, and so I think that it can be challenging to make a life inside of a place like that. But I think also there are a lot of um, what I like to call Jedi mind tricks inside of the workshop designed to make you feel um, less sure of yourself, less sure of your work. Um, and there are, if you are lucky, what you develop is a stronger sense of yourself and a powerful sense of discernment and being able to understand where people's feedback is coming from, where it's coming from a, a, a giving and generous and generative place, mm -hmm. and when it's trying to actually tear you down. Yes. Um, and so I think that if you come out stronger, good for you. I don't know that most people do, um, but yeah. And tips, maybe we'll wait, because yeah, uh, I'm talking great, too much. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm so glad you went first because that is a really wonderful summation of, of the MFA experience. So um, 
I had a similar trajectory. I was working here in, moved to New York um, after college, was working here at a job that I really loved and enjoyed, um, applying to grad school programs to be uh, in, in history and, and American studies and getting really close to going and then deferring, but really just <laughs> running away each time. Um, and doing that like an embarrassing amount of times. And then um, finally deciding like, why am I still setting myself up to go to these programs where I, I know in my heart that I'm not really interested in going. And in my mind, I was like, well, I'll just be an American studies professor and like write novels on the side, like that would ever work in any kind of way. Like either of those professions are easy to do. Um, so, so just being really honest with myself about what I wanted to do and realizing that I wanted to write, um, I applied to only one program to Hunter College and I applied there in part because it was in the city so I could stay here and I could um, work at this job that I believed really strongly in um, and then also um, I applied there because Hunter is not actually very strong on teaching, so because it's in the CUNY system, they already have a lot of adjuncts already working, so it's very hard actually to get a teaching position there. But what they do have instead is that you are, um, they have a fellowship where you're a assistant to a working writer. Um, and so that was very attractive to me. I, I, I talked to a lot of people there and someone was like, yeah, I'm Toni Morrison's assistant. Another person was like, yeah, I'm um, Jonathan Franzen's assistant. So um, I, that was very attractive to me that you get to work really closely with a working writer and see how they work and what they actually need you to kind of work on and what they do day to day. Like that question that everybody has, like what does a writer actually do day to day and how do you plan out a project? So. Um, so I applied to Hunter, it was the only school that I applied to. I luck, very luckily got in. Um, and I had told myself when I was gonna go to Hunter that this was just gonna be a space to work on, on, to work on writing, to um, train myself in the discipline of a writing practice to get used to writing and, and, um, and, and uh, producing work. Um, and that it was less important to me about the community aspect of that part. I would just kind of, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And I wouldn't really um, put a lot of stock into that, which is also a really <laughs> backwards way of thinking about it. Um, because you are in workshop with other writers, and that is um, being in workshop and figuring out how you relate to other writers and how they're relating to your work is a huge part of um, the MFA experience and can kind of take stuff over. And luckily for me, that was actually a really positive, surprisingly positive thing. Um, and I, I found a group of readers and a group of fellow writers who, um, became, who I became very close to and who uh, I feel like I can kind of talk to still about any kind of project or any kind of writing stuff that comes up. And, um, and uh, so, I think the pros for me were de was definitely that sense of community, which I think um, can sometimes be rare and difficult to find. Um, and my year that I went into Hunter was actually a little bit special in that um, nearly, a, the, the, of all the six students who were there, nearly everyone was a little bit older and had worked for a little while um, or were working during the program. Um, and so I think there was just a different life experience kind of thing happening in there that, that um, made people perhaps like a little bit more um, willing to reach out and kind of find common ground with people, I think. Um, and then also, so I think that was a, a huge pro there. And, and um, I think for the cons, I think what Naomi is talking about, that idea that they, that sometimes workshops run on this, those Jedi mind tricks on those ideas that we're gonna break you down to kind of make you stronger kind of thing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, workshops can sometimes rely, and I say this as, as leading workshops myself, I've done this in workshops where I rely way too heavily on that tactic just because um, you're trying to get somebody to understand how to um, continue to work on this piece of art that they're producing and how to deep in, deep dig down deep into themselves deep enough to think about it critically. Um, and so the easiest way to do that is to, um, you know, like kind of go the punitive route and be like, you gotta you got, you got, you got, you got, got to see this, kind of see this. Um, and so that can kind of be a con and it can be um, uh, really detrimental to your work and to your voice and kind of figuring yourself out. Um, and so I think, but I think recognizing that as you go in and recognizing that kind of as a community and also being able to name and to talk about that, which is one of the things that kind of happened a lot at Hunter is that 
if something like that happened, it wasn't kind of like you went off into the corner and cried by yourself and like didn't talk about it. Like you would say like, what the hell just happened? Like why did we just have that exchange that was really, um, uh, that felt really a certain way. Um, and so I think if you can, um, if you can generate that kind of energy in a, in a workshop yourself and kind of encourage that kind of energy of yourself and encourage of other people and then also search for those places where that kind of energy is welcome, um, it can be a really powerful experience. Hi, uh, my name's Kareem, um, and I went to the Michener Center. Um, I was working um, in a, an office job, one of those jobs where you pretend to work all day, and that was, that was really painful. And then I moved to Paris and uh, was a school teacher for like two and a half years. Um, and I knew that I wanted to read and write and talk about reading and writing all day, but I didn't have the confidence to do that without having some sort of structure identity, like student. Um, I, I think I had like a phobia of feeling like a loser, um, which is silly now, I see that now, but at the time I, I, was, I wasn't secure enough. So I thought if I apply to these programs, um, then I am definitively not a loser for three years <laughs> and, and I can read and write all day. Um, and I didn't really think much further than that. Um, and when I got there, um, I uh, ran into all of those delicious pros and cons. Um, the pros were that I did get to read and write all day. Um, and I built a lot of alliances and I just got insights I could have never guessed um, uh, having, um, just being part of this world and this community that, that they described. Um, I think a con, uh, one, one thing I noticed was something Naomi touched on was a lot of, I noticed a lot of people who came directly out of undergrad. Um, I think for them it kind of felt like a continuation of school um, and it was a sort of nebulous, unstructured time and I think um, it's A, conducive to depression to have that much free time <laughs> and uh, B, I think if you don't have, if you don't kind of see how hard it is out there and have a couple of bad jobs or um, I think it's really hard to appreciate just like how golden it is to have three years and literally get paid. It might be the only time in my life I get paid to sit in my pajamas and write little stories. <laughs> um, and so I, I did notice that that was a little bit harder to, to appreciate for some of the people coming straight out of school. Um, as for the workshop itself, I think in the beginning, mine was a three-year program, and in the beginning it was, there were some cons, and I think it was, there were some destructive moments um, and a lot of self-doubt. And I think s quite quickly, after a semester or two, I started kind of getting, I started feeling like hardened, um, but kind of in a good way, and I developed filters. And I think by the end of uh, this, th this epic three years of workshop, I kind of was able to say, I don't need workshop anymore. And it was a sort of growing pain. Uh, and there were sort of, you know, peaks and valleys. But I came out with like two or three great friends who will probably forever be my little intimate workshop. And, you know, that those alliances were built. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> Yeah, we, you know, I, I had mentioned the, the, the sacrifices I made uh, in the security office just so that I would have this uninterrupted time to read and write, and it's true, I did have that time. It's also true that that was taking place in the 90s. I think if there had been the internet, my story might have been very different, I may not even be here. And so I'm thinking about this idea that this provided some time uh, and, and a place to read and write all day. And it sounds like everybody had made a decision to sacrifice in moving, attending, giving up certain dreams, pursuing the, um, to, to pursue the MFA. But it, it brings the, the question to what happens once you get there. And so I'm wondering, how did you structure your time? How were you able to avoid the temptations of all the other things? Oh, I should be at this party. I should be attending these things. How were you able to find the time to write the work you did? Um, so, uh, is it Kareem or Kareem? 
Kareem. Kareem. Um, so Kareem um, pointed to this strange thing where for me, I went from having probably 60 to 80 hours a week job to having one class a week um, for two hours. And so I was kind of freaking out when I first got there about what to do with all this time, even though I said I needed all this time to write. Um, the reality is even today, I only write two or three hours a day, even when I'm pumping and working very hard. Um, and so I just... In the very beginning, I did a lot. I learned Portuguese. I did Afro-Cuban dance. Uh, I know, this sounds crazy now that I'm saying it out loud. But I worked really hard to fill up my time. And some of that was about filling up my time, but some of it, too, was actually about um, making sure that I had some breathing room outside of the workshop because it was such a bubble. Um, and so making friends out in Iowa City outside of the context of that program made me more sane, actually. Um, and the parties to me, sorry, were not that fun. And so it was very easy actually to be like, fuck this, I'm not going to these. Um, so I went to maybe two or three of them. You could do it every single night in Iowa City if you wanted to, but I'm about pleasure and um, these were not pleasurable experiences for me. Um, and so it was actually really easy to pull back from that. Um, but the basic structure of my days was like morning writing, workout, read, nap, go to sleep, begin again. That was it. Yeah. It's kind of the life of a retiree, in a way. <laughs> it's totally a semi-retired life. Oh, and I started going to the movies in the afternoons. <laughs> oh, um, I would just say I, I remember um, uh, that the pressure of having, not the pressure, but having other people in workshop who you knew were also kind of working on these things, for me at least, was like, well, I better work too because they're working really hard. And when I G-chat with them, they're like, I got to go because I'm working. And it's like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> I guess I should be working too. So um, that was actually to have that group of people to kind of hold you accountable who um, are also working um, hard or if they're not actually physically writing are, are, you know, saying I'm going to take this time to read the works of this whole author and we'll go talk about it, but like that's what I'm doing right now kind of thing. Um, so the discipline of other people was really um, helpful for me to cultivate my discipline. Yeah, I agree that there's like a very healthy social pressure um, going on there and it's, and it's just cool to be around other uh, writers that you, you develop an admiration for and that, and that sort of push you. I totally agree. Well, the idea of being around other writers makes me think of the other um, pro that I've been hearing, which is this idea of community. But then, you know, I, I think Caitlin just raised an interesting point. She was thinking about what her classmates or peers were doing, and, and that was inspiring her. But I think there's also a, a dark side to that, which is competition and what that does to our cr creative energies and our, and our creative centers. Um, so let me use that as a jumping off point to say, uh, did you enter your MFA programs with a sense of a project that you wanted to complete? Had you already had your novels underway? When I did my MFA program, I was using my, uh, I was submitting stories, and each one of my stories, if you look at my collection, you can almost see like, I'm working out point of view issues here, or I'm working out like interiority. Like, I was trying to learn my craft, but I had, I had classmates who had books pretty much done, and they were there to kind of polish them, and it aggravated me. Yeah. And uh, so, so did you enter your programs knowing what you wanted to do, and was competition a, a part of this? Um, yeah, so hmm. <clears throat> I did have, an, uh, I was about 60 pages into my, my first novel when I first started. And so I had sworn off women and alcohol for about six months in order to get there. It worked. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I came to Iowa with, with a novel that was very much in progress. It got stalled, but I actually started another novel that I'm working on right now. Um, and yeah, so I was very clear that if I was going to leave my very lovely life in Brooklyn, I better fucking finish a book because why else live in Iowa City? Um, and so um, I was very focused. I went to Barbados the summer after the first year to finish a first draft of it. And then I worked on probably eight or nine drafts of it over the following year. Um, I'm a Capricorn, I'm a West Indian, um, and I'm very hard-headed and I'm very hard-working. I can outwork almost anyone, I can say that pretty confidently. And so my sense of competition, I had a very strongly developed drive, um, but the competition was always with myself, right? So the standards that I had set for myself were quite high. They were higher than most of the people around me. Um, and I think 
my, I was competing with myself. There were other people who were maybe competing with me and others, but I mean, I wasn't paying attention to that. Um, yeah, it helped to be from Flatbush and to have a very strong sense of grit um, inside of that program, yeah. Yeah, I would just agree. I mean, like on a artistic level, like what do I want to do with a piece of work? The that answer was always inward for me as well. Like I had a really, I, I um, so I I went into the MFA program. I knew that I wanted to finish a project or or create something by the end of it. Um, and then our first semester, we were all challenged to start a novel with the um, idea that. Uh, if you start it with this group of other people who are kind of also figuring out this big project that's really difficult to, to be there, be around, you'll have this other group of people who are in the exact same boat as you to be able to talk to and to be able to figure stuff out with. Um, and that was also really helpful. Um, but in terms of like, what do I want this project to be, that was always an internal thing that was, that was guiding me. And the idea of like competing over who is I don't even know how you would do that, like writing the best or whatever, like wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't really occur. I mean, I think that's when it goes into like a really unhealthy pa place. But um, in terms of thinking like, um, you know, the person who's sitting next to me is taking this book, his, his book as seriously as I'm taking my book and is also taking my book seriously when they read it and I'm taking their book seriously when we read it is, was actually a really helpful thing to generate work. And so you, you started your novel in your MFA program. That was, mm -hmm. you took up that assignment and that's what you ended up with, your book. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the book now was a short story idea that I had for, for it and um, I, I brought that in and was, I mean, what was helpful about the MFA program was somebody telling me that's, this isn't a short story. Like, this is, <laughs> this is, this is, a, this is something that can be longer and, um, and I think when you're a uh, writer, a beginning writer, it can be hard to figure that out about projects that you're working on. And, and if, you were, if I was just working on that on my own, I would probably just think, oh, this short story sucks because it's not coming together and not realize like, oh, it's because it's not supposed to be right. a short story. Yeah, yeah I, had, I had a similar experience. I had no intention of writing a novel. Um, and uh, I, I still hadn't really figured out how to write short stories. And um, so I, I, I wrote, there was a writing prompt in a first year seminar and uh, a teacher said, this, is, this, is, uh, this has some like, energy, this has some life to it, just keep going. And it was until like 60, 70 pages in, I was like, oh God, I think I'm writing a novel. <laughs> um, so I, I really, yeah, I really resisted the idea. Um, but then I found it sort of by chance that this was, this was a space I felt more comfortable in, these sort of broad brush strokes. And I realize now that I always felt kind of, um, confined by the short story. I was like overly aware of it, their, its shortness. <laughs> and, and, and like you said, having, having some sort of, you know, completion in, in the near future. Um, and in terms of, in terms of competition, um, one great thing about my program was that it's multidisciplinary. So you have a, you have a, you have all sorts of disciplines. You have screenwriters, uh, playwriters, um, playwrights, uh, poets, and fiction writers all in the same class. So that creates a really cool texture in terms of in terms of aesthetics and style. And so there was like I think there was like a there was a, there was a significant lack of competition, and it was quite a supportive environment. Um, yeah. And how long was it until you finished your until you finished the novel? Was it in the program? If it was yeah. It was like right before. It was maybe like five days before graduating. I heard that wow. someone picked it up, <laughs> and so my graduation speech was just like me sobbing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was, was really lucky. I, I did not. I mean, it took me a long time afterwards, like a couple of years afterwards, of just still working by myself, I guess. Um, wow. But what was helpful was that I had those two years before to help keep the faith when you really just are completely alone, completely outside of an MFA environment and still working on this project, yeah. Um, but yeah. Can I just say one thing? I, I always begin um, whenever I do public things with gratitude and I wanted to give some gratitude to the Asian American Writers Workshop oh, because um, this was where I did literary speed dating back in like, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago. Um, and also I met Sam Chang from the IR Writers Workshop at, at the Asian American Writers Workshop about six months before I started. And um, it was such a fateful meeting. It meant so much to me. Um, and it felt like a very distinct before and after in my career. So thanks to the workshop. Absolutely. Yeah. You're here.
So this is that moment that all moderators sort of cringe uh, having to do. Uh, I want to open it up to questions from the audience, if that's OK. Uh, I do have a great idea, though. If you don't have a question, a lot of times people say, well, who would like to go? Uh, if you don't ask a question in the next 30 seconds, I am going to force everybody on this panel to answer the question, can writing be taught? So just thank you. I, Please, and would you stand up? Do, do, does anybody need a microphone, or do we? OK, I'll repeat the question if I can. Um, I have a question uh, of the sort of day-to-day -day of the workshop of line pressure from what my friend told me that the MFA experience that they're really busy reading, have this really long reading list, and having to write essays about the wall. And so I was turned off from the MFA because I didn't have to focus on my creative work. But from what you said, like, you didn't want to spend time. So is it just the fact that the Iowa So, so the question was that, uh, that the, the questioner had heard that in some MFA programs, you're assigned a lot of reading of literature that you then write commentary on, which would take away from the time of write, doing your own writing. And, and she wasn't hearing that from the panelists, and she was wondering if there was that component that they hadn't mentioned. Yeah, I think it's really uh, program to program. I think like Cornell has a, like a more like, like heavier reading load. Uh, my program has a particular, like it's just like so wide open, like you couldn't fail. Like it would be hard to fail a class. Um, they, they really treat you like fellow writers, like hey, do your thing. And so, so there's a tremendous amount of flexibility, I think, and just everything in between. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. So the schedules, the, the schedules that the MFA programs have, I know that mine had two. So we had a literature and a workshop, one per week. Um, and we were expected to make the most of our time outside of those class hours. What about you? How many class was it? Yeah, it was the same exact yeah. thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, it was the same. I mean, um, I, I have not, obviously did not do it. But I mean, another option that some people find really helpful is a low residency MFA, where you're um, only going to the classes and, and it's just like really intense, maybe like a week yeah. at a time, and then the rest of the time you are in your own life, um, just writing on your own and keeping in contact through email with, um, with faculty. Um, so some people find that way really helpful to go along, and, and I mean there's like fantastic low residency MFA programs as well. Yeah, and often in, in the MFA programs in mine, the last semester was class free. It was a thesis work semester, and you worked one on one. So I think that's a good question because you need. To, I didn't do enough research, and I know a lot of my students. Now I encourage them research the hell out of these programs. They can look different from from program to program. More questions. I want to. Oh wait, say can I say one thing yeah. to that? Go, go, go. Um, the, there's a really great book called The Creative Writing MFA Handbook. Um, so when I applied the third time, I was like, let's be serious. Um, <laughs> and so I read that book, and um, Poets and Writers had an MFA issue that I looked at. Um, and I applied to 11 programs. I had an application chart. I was very serious, um, and I think it helped. Um, but yeah, you should do research, because if you don't want to be in a program where you have to be in literature classes, then don't apply to those programs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I would also add, just when you're doing that research, um, uh, when at Hunter, one of the really helpful things that they told us after we got in, which was not that helpful when after we got in, but when you are, but when you're looking at places, look at who the faculty is, read their work, like really actually read their work, and then figure out if that is a person who you want to work with. Not saying like I don't like their work, but does their work speak to you? Is there some things there that you are interested in? Are they? following things that you're interested in, even if on the surface they're not interesting in, is there something there that you think you can kind of learn from that work? That's probably the place, the places you should be heading towards. That's great. Uh, right here, yes. So when you're kicked out of the MFA nest and having to fend for yourself, what was that like? Um, I'm still in denial <laughs> of that. Um, I have, uh, so I, I sold my book and then I've just been 
um, watching my bank account go down every month. I weep briefly and then I keep writing. Um, that, yeah, that's it. So I've got I've got a few months left of this <laughs> before I got to. Have sort, you been able to stick to up. a writing schedule at all? Is writing yeah, still part of your yeah? Yeah, I think it's it's a huge motivator to be broke. Um, <laughs> And um, so, yeah, so I, I hope to be finished with, with my next book before the end. Oh, <laughs> um, so I, uh, I worked, I was working while I was in the MFA, but that was because I was at a job that was very, um, was very, was understanding of the fact that I was in this program and then was also aligned with the stuff. I was a researcher for a history museum, so it's very similar to the stuff that I was working on, very specific situation. Um, but I think afterwards, um, the stuff that was most important was uh, spending the time in the MFA to um, train yourself to set up those writing schedules and those writing, um, uh, how you're actually gonna get kind of the writing done. And then once you're out, keeping kind of that commitment going. So um, I, I think once you're out, it can be a little bit hard to explain to people like why you're not hanging out with them still anymore, you know? Um, why you're still, yeah, why you still don't have time for drinks even though you're out of school and you have this degree. Um, and, and so you kind of have to set up those boundaries for yourself once you're out. Um, and kind of make that commitment to yourself that you're going to kind of spend that time um, and just and also make peace with the fact that some people will understand that and some people never will, like will never understand why you can't have drinks. <laughs> um, so I graduated three years ago um, and I took a series of personal and financial sacrifices in order to focus on my writing in the last three years. So um, yeah, I've been broke for the last five years. I've, I mean, this past semester I taught at Oberlin. It was the first time I had a steady paycheck in five years. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a struggle, personally and financially, um, to make it work. But I, I believe that the patience and the commitment and dedication to my work was worth it. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the tide seems to be changing. I have a real job starting in the fall. Um, and, um, you know, my book came out. I'm almost finished with the next one. So I don't regret it, but I, I would also not be up here perpetrating the fraud that has yeah. all been so easy and so sweet. Yeah. It's a wonderful note to end on. We're out of time and we want to make room for our next panel, so thank you so much for your attention. I sent this damn PhD book out to academic publishers and one publisher after the next rejected it. I went and read the reader's report from Cambridge University Press. It was the harshest thing I've, I'd ever received. I would recommend it with conditions. You know, like, um, uh, ultimately, like in that question, can you teach writing or can't you teach writing, I come down on the side <laughs> of you can't really teach writing, but you can um, expand your mind, you know, get some other voices that are not your own.